Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of One Vision. Joining us this week is a longtime friend, Rianne Horgan, founder and CEO of Silver. And it has been a long while since I met you in one of the Finnovates in New York. Welcome to the show, Rianne. Thanks so much for having me back, Theo. I appreciate it. Oh, so um, you have a very interesting, interesting, interesting journey um, because beside being a FinTech founder, you are also a JPM veteran and veteran meaning you have spent 17 years there. It's a long career. Um, tell us a little bit about what prompted you to, you know, start something completely new and start Kinder and what the platform is about and what is new with Silver. Yeah, so um, I guess the back the background really was, um, you know, after having worked for 17 years in JP Morgan, and I'd worked um, predominantly in the wealth management business, um, I became that trusted child who my parents were talking to about retirement. And so for the greater part of a decade, um, the conversation with my parents was about um, when they were going to retire. And, um, you know, my parents were part of this baby boomer generation whose retirement looked like it got thrown a curveball in 2008. Um, uh, because of the financial crisis. And so for a long time, the conversation was when. And then about four or five years ago, the conversation shifted for when to how. Um, and that's when I took um, a trip to Barnes & Noble and bought my first book on social security. And um, that 400-page book really was the early inspiration uh, for our app, Silver. And, you know, very simply, you know, here I was, someone who had worked in financial services for 17 years, had, adv had been advising high net worth families on investments. And I thought to myself, like, how possibly can the average customer, you know, make the best decisions about this life lifetime income if they have to navigate 400 pages? Um, and I think what surprised me at the time was I had, um, in my last couple of years at JP Morgan, started working on a number of innovation projects, um, particularly around kind of the early days of the marketplaces and had been working with a number of marketplaces who already had transferred from true, um, you know, peer to peer lending platforms to needing institutional pools of capital. And so I was seeing how the marketplaces were making investing so much easier for the average consumer to understand. But when I went out and started to try to find a solution for my parents, I couldn't find anything. Um, and what dawned on me as I started doing this research was there was all this amazing technology in kind of version one of fintech that had been built, but it all really solved for the same use case, which was kind of a 25 year old um, yeah, individual who maybe had some student loans and was looking to start saving. Um, and I quickly realized there was a tremendous bias against this customer in their 50s and 60s, this misperception that they didn't know how to use technology. And as a result, they were being relegated to an offline um, um, solution. So that was the earliest insight. I think as we dug in and we think about where we are today, the second insight that came out of the early user research that we did was this interconnection between health and wealth. Um, and look, I myself have been very fortunate that in my lifetime, healthcare has not been a financial issue for me. Um, and it's not to, to say that it isn't for, um, you know, many people in their 30s and 40s, there are lots of people in their 30s and 40s in America where healthcare is a financial issue. But I would just tell you that every 50 and 60 year old I talked to talked about healthcare in financial terms. Um, and that was the beginning for me also of understanding this like connectivity and interwovenness of what retirement in America looks like. Um, so the early inspiration for Silver was how do we how do we use this like tech infrastructure that's been built to serve millennials, but actually build a product that works for this demographic who instead of accumulating wealth is decumulating wealth. How do we really think about this interconnectivity of health and wealth? And then thirdly, most importantly, and this will this um, will kind of go a lot to where we are today, is how do we help this consumer achieve confidence? Um, what we see is this customer um, being you know, very overwhelmed by the decisions they need to make, um, wanting to spend time to do the research, wanting to commit to the process, but not finding an easy way to navigate, you know, arguably some of the most um, consequential financial and health decisions they'll make of their lifetime. Um, and our hope is that Silver can be there to be their guide. Well, it's it's interesting to, to to talk about healthcare and people in their fifties and sixties, and you know, think about what that is long term, especially coming out of a pandemic as the last 15, 18 months have been anything but normal, especially when it comes to health. 
Uh, so between COVID-19 and the need to change how we work and how we live and, you know, for those of us with kids, how the kids learn, how, how has the last, you know, year and a half impacted the way that you think about the product and the way that your clients are talking to you about how they use the app? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is that it's clear that that kind of financial plan that sits on a binder that you do once every five years um, is a relic of the past. Um, you know, if we think about what happened last year, what we saw is that the vast majority of our consumers' plans changed. It might have been they were retired out and they needed to find part-time jobs. It might have been that they had a, um, a parent that got sick and they needed to take time out of the workforce. It could also be that they had children they needed to take care of. Um, and so what we saw was this intense need to recalibrate plans and to be able to really kind of think about all these different moving pieces. Um, the second thing we saw, and I think is just interesting when we think about healthcare, I think one of the wild things that I've learned in my journey um, is a little bit about the ACA market. Um, and you know, there's a conversation in Washington today about potentially changing the enrollment age of Medicare from 65 to 60. But today, a lot of consumers think about retiring before the age of 65. And the big challenge that they have with that is figuring out how to navigate healthcare pre-65. What's fascinating is that the ACA market is probably, I think it's the only place in the healthcare market where healthcare plans are priced on age. Um, so an ACA plan for a 60 year old is four times ex as expensive as an ACA plan for a 25 year old. Um, and so that is pretty wild. So you think about being in the midst of COVID, losing your job, needing to navigate the ACA market for the first time and all of a sudden realizing that the plan costs you know, 800 to thousand dollars a month for an individual. Um, that I think has been really shocking. So um, to me, what we've seen is heightened engagement. We've seen um, you know, e even more increased adoption by this demographic of technology. So it's true that this demographic you know, isn't going to be the first adopter on TikTok, but they're, you know, they're actively using Zoom, they're, they're on Facebook, they're using Instacart, um, and the places where they, the, the kind of the apps that they may not have been using pre-COVID, they certainly are using post-COVID. Um, so what we see is a kind of a rapid acceleration in their usage of technology, but also a greater need because there, this has been this moment where a lot of the plans have changed. Now, not all of it has been negative. You know, you think about, um, I think about my customers that live in the Northeast and the exodus from large cities. So in my, my, my in-laws hometown, like the retirees are doing great because they've all been selling their homes to the younger folks that are moving, moving from cities. But that decision to move I actually would say is arguably the most important financial decision you'll make in retirement um, because the difference in healthcare costs, the difference in cost of living, the difference in taxes can literally add six, seven, eight years on the left of, of your retirement savings. And so what we see is this consumer really trying to think about, you know, this window in time, how do they make adjustments? But I also think that there's a realization that there's no sense of permanency. This is like your retirement plan isn't static. It's like an evolving, breathing. I want to say document, but it's not a document anymore, right? It's it's an app, and it's and it's and it's constantly moving. That is so true, and it reminds me of many years ago when I first looked at retirement. Oftentimes, remember those spreadsheets that people would give you? Mm -hmm. It's like a one time, right? fill in like these four pages of whatever, make all kinds of assumptions. And here you go, a static plan that you follow, doesn't matter what happens next. And it is very, very true. It's um, that that needs to change. We need to, to think of it more as a plan, a fluid plan that adapts constantly to what's going on around us. Um, and speaking of uh, recently, just heard um, US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo um, she sat something which it, 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 it was so spot on and so sad at the same time, um, talking about plans and stuff. She said, America's aging demographics were going to hit the country like a ton of bricks without increased federal aid. And she warned that the current situation was untenable. Now, the, the thing is, I think for most of us, unless you had not read the news, you would have noticed that people are getting older. This is this is not a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and it's not just the US, it's also around the world. We have seen other countries 
um, at least attempting to do a little bit more, right, to address it from a social perspective um, and to create a more stable infrastructure, if you will, to support, not just support the aging demographics, but also find ways to to help them and and uh, continue their, their long journey. Because, you know, as, as you know, we all not only live longer and you know, we all uh, live longer, healthier, but also we do work longer too, right? So there are a lot of dynamics um, that comes with longevity. So what do we need to do in here? What are some of the things that you think we can learn from other countries? Um, so let me start with um, something that we can do here in the States that I think is very US centric. And then we can maybe just talk more about the kind of the global dynamics. On, on the US side, the first thing I would just say is we need to modernize social security. Social security represents more than 50% of my customers' um, retirement income. For most baby boomers, it's the only um, source of lifetime income they have, meaning you know most of my customers don't have a full pension. So they really need that longevity insurance. Um, but it is pretty wild when you start to scratch the surface and you see that social security was created you know, 80, 90 years ago. And a lot of the rules, frankly, haven't evolved to what life in America looks like today. Um, two areas that I would just flag. Um, the first is, and this is very relevant to, to COVID, which is caregivers. Um, so we know that we have a crisis in America, whether it's caring for children or caring for older parents, where we have um, you know, millions of unpaid caregivers. What is not fully understood is that when those caregivers leave the workforce for a period of time to take care of family members, not only are they likely to re-enter the workforce at a lower wage, but they also give up their earnings history for social security while they're taking care of their parents. And so what that means is they're basically accumulating these zeros that go into their retirement savings. Um, and that's really problematic because you're making choices in your 30s and 40s, maybe when you're taking care of kids, maybe it's choices in your 50s and 60s, taking care of older parents, and you're trying to make the best decision for that family member and not, and I would argue that the vast majority of Americans have no idea that that decision is also impacting their social, their long-term retirement security. Um, so we've been really excited to partner with Senator Murphy um, on the Social Security Caregiving Credit Act. And that act is really focused on providing at least a minimum floor of Social Security credits for caregivers. Um, I think there's more to go there, but um, that's the first thing I would say is like reform of Social Security when it comes to caregivers. Second, I would just say spousal benefits. A vast majority of Americans don't understand how spousal benefits work, and in particular for individuals that get divorced. There is a lack of understanding that one party will get 100% benefit and the other party, most likely the female, will get a 50% benefit. So basically you have this kind of in, unbalanced outcome at the end um, when, when you have a divorce. Uh, and then finally, and this is very of the moment right now, is um, the cost of living adjustment. So we think about lifetime income and inflation protection. You know, just um, earlier this week, um, the June inflation numbers came out and, you know, um, year over year, we saw inflation at 5.4%, its highest in, you know, well over a decade. Um, it's it's understood that, um, you know, while there is a cost of living adjustment with Social Security, it actually, the basket that that, that cost of living adjustment is tied, is tied to doesn't actually represent how retirees spend their money. Um, so just this week, um, Congressman Garamendi um, um, introduced the Fair Cola for Seniors Act, and that's an act we're really excited to see, which is just, again, making sure that we're helping this community keep up with um, the, 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 the inflation um, that, that certainly is more present today than it was a few years ago. So reform of Social Security be one thing, and that's very U.S. centric, because I guess the good thing I would say is that the United States does have this large program. It's, uh, you know, I think even calling it a benefit is a misnomer because it's actually a forced savings program. We all pay into it as part of our taxes. Um, but it is, unlike countries like the UK, it is like the predominant driver of retirement income in America. Um, the second thing, and this is more of a global perspective, and maybe the UK is a good example here, which is just healthcare. And um, again, it goes back to where we started this conversation, which is for this demographic, you can't have a conversation about finances without having a conversation about healthcare. Um, and so one of the things that we've done in the app is we've gotten really focused on helping the consumers understand the cost of health care. Um, and we make it really personalized. So um, you may know that part of Medicare is priced at the federal level. So that's part A and part B of Medicare. But supplemental plans and drug plans are actually priced based on your location. So they're zip code based. Um, and so within our app, we use a lot of data to really help this customer personalize their health care plan to understand if they're living in New York right now, but moving to Florida, 
what does that, what is the difference in the supplemental drug plan or supplemental plan, or like how much does a drug plan cost in Florida versus costing in New York? And really helping the consumer understand that Medicare is not free. Part A may be quote unquote free, but in totality, Medicare is not free. Um, and you know, we spend a lot of time in the planning side, really helping the consumer understand not only the premiums, but the total costs. One of the things I worry a lot about right now is the how Medicare Advantage plans are promoted um, and they're predominantly promoted as free. And they are not free. Uh, it may be that they're a zero premium plan, but that does not mean that your total costs for the year are free. Um, so I bring all that up and I reference the UK because you know obviously there's a very different healthcare system there and one might argue, and, I, and full disclosure, I grew up in the UK, I was born in Wales. Um, so, and, and actually had my first child in the, um, in the NHS, the national healthcare system in the UK. Um, and look, people who are part of the NHS and they look at the American healthcare system will often say, well, look, you get so much more choice, more, you, can get, you can get care faster. Um, but the downside to all of that in the States is the cost. Um, and so when I think about what the support is that the average American needs going into retirement, it's really thinking more holistically about the cost of healthcare and how do we, how do we think about the total cost rather than just premiums? Because I think it is very easy for a congressman or a president or a former president to talk about how they're reducing the premiums. But really that is, that is just like the tip of the iceberg. We have to really look at the total cost of what these plans are for the American consumer. I always find it really interesting, the sort of dichotomy in the industry between, you know, people that are maybe conservative on one side, not wanting to hand out things uh, like healthcare benefits, when if we actually provided more healthcare benefits and included more ways for people to systematically save and invest and retire and access these services, that everybody would be sort of better off, including the banks and other financial service firms that are serving the people in these communities. So I, I, I always... I, I look at healthcare as this thing that we just need to fix and solve. And it's just the impact in the long term of our finances. And to your point, our impact of that on our health is so significant. One of the other things you mentioned was your retirement benefits like pensions. And, you know, both my parents had pensions of different sorts. And, you know, my dad worked at United for 37 years and had this pension or has this pension. And I, I think about, you know, the employer stepping back away from both financial health and physical health over the last 50 years. And this is another thing that we need to figure out. But now we're seeing more employers sort of going back into maybe a little bit more employer physical wellness and a little bit more financial health because they realize how important it is not only to their workers, but to, to their companies as well. And even though they don't offer retirement benefits and a lot of jobs are more sort of moving more transient, becoming more gig work, people do need help. And so is there a way that you can see employers doing a bit more to sort of shore up some of the, the safety net and some of the things that we pay into that aren't necessarily distributed very evenly? Yeah, so I think um, on the positive side, we've certainly seen this resurgence um, and focus by employers on wellness and let's even say financial wellness. Um, the skeptic in me would, however, say that it's been all about millennials. It's all about how do I attract a millennial as, as a worker? Um, and so, you know, lots of companies now have student loan repayment programs or they have, you know, the class pass membership for the gym. Um, I would posit that the generation of consumers that I serve, boomers are being left behind. They're being ignored in that conversation because for most boomers, it isn't about paying down the student loans. It's thinking about, do I do a catch up contribution? How do I think about this pre-retirement healthcare? How do I pull the picture together? Um, so I would really encourage corporate America to be thinking about financial wellness across their demographic rather than just being a, how do I, how do I get young talent into my company? Um, because what we see is that older employees are very, very loyal, frankly, probably more loyal than millennials. And they are they think a lot more holistically about what the company is bringing to the table. They don't necessarily want volatility. They really want healthcare benefits, um, particularly given the conversation we've just had. I think one of the interesting things that we see in our customer base today is this desire, either forced desire or um, a kind of uh, real true emotional desire to work part-time in retirement. So 70% of our customers plan to work part-time in retirement, 80% of women and 60% of men. 
like that number is pretty wild when you think about it. And I think what it says to you is that the old days of like working to 62 or 65 and then quitting cold turkey are gone. There's this new like phased retirement that people are moving from full time to part time and then into retirement. And what I hear from consumers who are going through that journey is that they're when they think about that part time work, they're looking for the benefit they're looking for is healthcare. They they need a bridge to Medicare, um, and they want to make sure they're getting solid healthcare at that period in time. Um, they want more flexibility, so they're often willing to work twenty hours a week, thirty hours a week, but they don't want to be you know in the office um, forty hours a week. Um, and they many times are trying to think about like what else new could they learn. I think what's been fascinating about that what they can learn is that there's major biases in the system against this consumer about educating them. Um, I guess the perception is that, look, this employee is only going to be around for five years, so why would I waste the energy to, to kind of retool this employee? And I think the reality is there's a lot of other skills that employees bring to the table that can really help other generations. Um, so I think what I see is this dramatic desire for part-time income. But interestingly, and I was, I was talking with someone the other day about this, they were asking me whether you know, I knew customers who were participating in like a sponsored phase retirement plan in their company. So the company was allowing this kind of move from full-time to part-time. And the interesting thing was I said, actually, almost everyone that I've talked to is, is, is having to leave their company and do this. They're not actually able to stay at their company. Um, and I think that's like, you know, potentially a really interesting opportunity to think about like, how do you create a benefits package that is really suited towards this employee that has five to seven years left um, um, is is willing to contribute in different ways to the company, but again, from the benefits package perspective, like they'll take a little bit less cash if they can get a really good healthcare plan. That 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 is brilliant. I, I don't know why not more people think about it, especially you know when we keep hearing that companies have challenges. Um, bringing in new talents or, you know, they're struggling to retain people that that would have been a great way to to look at how can we still make use of the experience, right? The life experience of, of your employees, not just, you know, looking at how much can we squeeze out from them. <laughs> so we are past the halfway mark for 2021. Um, well, it's been fireworks. I think that would be the one word I would use to describe them tech. Um, do you have any specific predictions on what's to come? for the remainder of the year for all of us and and what's next for silver maybe i'll start with what's next and then i think that maybe goes to what's what's to come um so we've you know been very focused over the last year on helping this consumer navigate this kind of wild new world that they're in we launched the app silver in the spring of 2020 we've had over 120,000 baby boomers download the app during this time period um we we started by providing them some real clarity on where they stood and that was through our retirement score that told them how long their savings was going to last um it's powered by a lot of data so over 5,000 data points that go into helping a customer understand you know will their savings last until they're 85 or 90 or 95. Um, and we saw tremendous engagement with that and i think the insight we gained from that is that you know this consumer is more afraid of running out of money in retirement than dying and so this fear of running out of money is really palpable um, and our retirement score, I think, hit the nail on the head in helping the customer understood, like, understand, are they okay? Um, about six weeks ago, we launched our retirement school and um, really excited about this. The, the, the premise here is that, you know, this customer has a lot of high consequence, brand new decisions that they're making in their 50s and 60s. They're trying to figure out Social Security. They're trying to figure out Medicare. They're trying to look at the ACA market, perhaps, for the first time. And they're really willing to do a lot of research. So they are out there trying to get answers. Um, whether or not they have a financial advisor, they go to Dr. Google to start their research. And the challenge is that Dr. Google is not giving them any confidence. They end up in this never ending Google search where they read their first article about Social Security. They click on three links. They read three more articles. They click on three more links and they end up in this like abyss. And what's so fascinating is on one hand, we think about there being so much financial literature out there for this consumer to educate them, but none of it is really put together in a way that evokes confidence for the consumer and helps them understand, do they know, do they know what they need to know? So when we launched um, the retirement school um, six weeks ago, we had three 
kind of value props to the consumer. The first was this was going to be easy to read. So every we have over 200 lessons in school. Um, every lesson is one to five minutes long. So this is not about needing to put aside an hour on the weekend. This is like, you know, you're in between conference calls and you got 10 minutes or you're, you know, waiting to pick up your child from the soccer and you've got a few minutes, you can just quickly get in there, read a lesson and then and come back at a later time to continue. The second thing is that it's jargon free. Um, I, I, I remember when I when I bought that first social security book, you know, with my highlighter, just needing to go to the back to the appendix to like understand all these defined terms. It was just mind boggling, um, you know, PIA, full retirement age, like all these words that I'd never heard of before. And so we've got a commitment that like we're going to have to we're going to explain those words, but we're not going to like lean into the jargon. Like we really want to make this accessible. And the last piece is that it's up to date. Um, and the good and the bad news is that like retirement policy is always shifting. And so one of the things that we hear from our customers is they finally feel like they figured it out. And then all of a sudden the RMD age is changing. And so it's like they get to a point where they're like, OK, I got it. And then they're like, oh, I got to figure this out all over again. What's been wild with retirement school is that it's really shifted our app usage from monthly to weekly. Um, and so our customers are now coming in every single week. They're reading these lessons. Um, it is giving them the confidence um, to really help them navigate this, these decisions they need to make. And so where we're going, Theo, when you ask like what's next, is it's all about like how do we become the masterclass or the Skillshare or the Udemy for retirement? And so what I mean by that is how do we pair the best of modern e-learning platforms with this subject matter this customer needs to understand? And then ultimately, how do we pair that with their retirement plan? So for example, imagine a world where you have told us in your onboarding profile with Silver that you're a divorced female in your 50s um, and you're thinking about retiring in two years. So already what I know is you're divorced. So I'm getting some, getting some information about divorce benefits for social security might be interesting. And you've also told me that you're planning, you're in your 50s and you're planning on retiring in a few years. So that means you're not going to be able to transition straight to Medicare. So perhaps you'd be interested in learning about pre-retirement health care. So what's coming at Silver is the ability to actually deliver that personalization. So we know enough about you to be able to say, here are the first two classes, read about divorce benefits, read about the ACA marketplace. Oh, and by the way, when you're in those lessons, let's connect the dots between how much your ACA plan is, looks like it's gonna cost versus the average ACA plan. And what does that mean for your retirement plan? So think about pulling your data into that experience. And so that you really understand not only am I learning about this topic, but I understand how it impacts my financial plan. Um, I get really excited about that because again, I think there are these modern mechanisms that are well-trodden around e-learning and tech. And so thinking about applying that to this subject matter for a consumer who has shown they are willing to spend time doing their research. This is a, this is a very different consumer from a millennial. This is not a consumer um, or maybe it's Gen Z now, or right? this is not a consumer that has like 30 seconds to spend with you. Like they are willing to dedicate time. They know these are important decisions. And so it's all about how do you create experience that really helps them. Um, so that's like where we're going. And I think the undertone there is a topic that we've discussed um, a number of times already in this conversation, which is this intersection of health and wealth. And so what I, what we're doing at Silver and what I hope to see more of, particularly on the corporate side, is this recognition that health and wealth are not separate, they are they are intermingled. Um, if we think about FinTech and Health Tech 1.0, it was all about a very narrow focus on you know, 401ks or something very, very specific. We, we need to in this next generation of what we're doing in FinTech and Health Tech is really think about these this intersection between the two. Um, and I think that's where um, the power of data becomes really, you know, really important. Like we have tremendous amounts of data that allow us to start to personalize these plans based on your healthcare costs, based on, you know, where you live, you know, all of that starts to allow us to really give that customer a more precise um, recommendation and also help them understand where they, where they sit. Um, so what I hope to see um, in the future, and I think you're starting to see this on the corporate side, is this intersection of health and wealth. Um, you see a lot of corporates going into the, the health side. Um, you know, Walmart's a good example. Um, Amazon's a good example. And when you think about those, those organizations already have been in the fintech space too. And so I think there's a great opportunity for the big guys, as well as kind of us small startups um, to really you know, think more holistically about how we help this consumer. 
Love that. But before we close, one last thing. How do we find out more about Silver and Kinder? Yeah, so um, all you need to do is um, you either go to the App Store and you type in Silver, which is S-I-L-V-U-R, and you can download the app. Um, we have a 30-day free trial, so you can get in, read some retirement school classes. If you have a mom or dad or loved one that's in the age of 50 to 70, send them over there. Um, or you can go directly to our website, which is www.silversilvur.com. Um, and on the site, um, we'll show you how you can download the app. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rianne, for spending time with us today. And I hope all of you do go do that um, because there is a tremendous amount of information useful. I think it's not just for your loved ones, but also for us personally, too. I feel like I have a lot I need to um, brush up on because it's, it's a maze. But um, thank you so much for spending time with us today, Rianne. And thank you all for listening in for another episode of One Vision. We will talk to you all next week.